Good morning, and thanks everyone for joining us uh, for today's presentation. We have Daniel Strauss, who's going to talk about how he implemented a continuous delivery culture and process at Gazengo um, from early on. Daniel brings a deep experience with over 20 years in the tech industry and the last 10 running QA and setting up continuous delivery for several startups. Before I get started, I just wanted to cover a few things. You have the ability to ask questions during the presentation using the Q&A box within the WebEx panel. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll do a Q&A session um, and review as many of these questions as the time permits. Also, we are recording this session and we'll be emailing it out to all registrants after the webinar um, tomorrow. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass things over to Daniel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining me and uh, uh, let's get started. Um, so I'm going to talk today about continuous deployment at Goes and Go, which is where I work, and basically how we went about starting uh, from the inception of this place, how we decided we wanted to do continuous deployment and how we went about actually doing that. So let me get started by uh, giving you a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So I'll give you a little, uh, couple bullet points here. You know, we'll, I'll talk about what Gozengo is, what we do, why we decided to do continuous deployment, things like how we were able to get buy-in, the challenges to implementation, why did we use uh, Selenium and WebDriver, for example, uh, choices that we made in terms of uh, what kind of uh, 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 tools we wanted to use to actually build our testing harnesses. Uh, how we do our CI on CD, you know, Jenkins and Sauce Labs, how Sauce Labs comes into play and how it works very, how it's tightly integrated into the things that we do. Basically give you a sh an example of how it all works, show a little bit of code, and then talk about some of the things that we're going to do, not right now, but hopefully in the future to improve the process. So what is GoZingo? Um, basically what we are, we are a B2C online vacation shopping site, which means you want to look for vacation, you come to our site, and uh, we sell both hotel and package uh, vacation packages to you. Currently, we are offering and do sell trips to the Caribbean, and we're hoping to do more destinations in the future. Uh, you can see below, that's an example of our front page. So you come, you take a look, you see what you want, you do searches, so on and so forth. Currently, our tech team is about 12 devs. Uh, there are three QA engineers with me being the director of QA. I have two people reporting to me, and we have four ops people. Uh, the team is small, uh, and I've been here basically since the company started when we were only about seven or eight people. So why did we want to do continuous deployment? Well, like I said, I started about three months into uh, Gozengo's life, and uh, when I started, we didn't even really have a product. So uh, there really wasn't much to test, but the idea was is that we wanted to work in a way that allowed us to be fast and allowed us to, when we started to actually build the product, be able to make changes very quickly to it. We wanted to, like, basically – ingrain that culture here so that as we actually got to the point of product and release and all that, it wouldn't be have, it wouldn't be something that we'd have to then bring in. It would already be what well, we're already doing this. So it's not really a problem. Uh, so we, you know, the reasons we decided, you know, we, we wanted to get our, ourselves into the habit of working and pushing code quickly. Uh, we wanted to make devs more responsible for checking their stuff at earlier stages. One of the very, very important pieces to remember with continuous deployment is it's not just QA's responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility to, to generate a quality product. So things like unit testing, spot checks, local environments, cross-browser testing, all of that comes into play. Uh, we want it to be agile and use Scrum, and continuous deployment works very well in that model because it allows you to, you know, in your two weeks, in your two weeks sprints, to basically build some things, 
get them out, get them out quickly, find issues with them, iterate quickly, and the continuous deployment allows you to do those quick iterations. Uh, also, one of the really, really nice things about doing continuous deployment is that when you do check-ins, if that check-in breaks something, you're getting immediate feedback. And that's kind of the, the real power of, of continuous deployment is you want that very, very quick feedback so that you know, hey, I pushed something, I broke it, I either have to fix it or I can roll it back and let the next person go. So how does it all work? So right now we use GitHub, and GitHub is basically uh, where all of our code resides. We have uh, separate repositories for uh, the test code and for our application code. Uh, devs work in their branches and they create pull requests. All the PRs have to be reviewed by at least one other dev. And the things that we usually check for in the PRs are the following. We check for correctness. Now, when I say correctness, obviously, correctness isn't did you write the code correctly. It's more of uh, we check for things like do you have proper formatting? Do you know? Do we uh, we ascribe to let's say certain coding standards? In other words, we want spaces here and we want tabs here and we want a space between this letter and this parentheses. So certain levels of correctness are checked, and we try to automate that. Testability. Is what you're building something that you can easily test? The reason that's important, as I said, is because we want devs to write as much unit tests as they can to be able to check their stuff in isolation. If their stuff isn't testable, then it's going to be very hard for them to write unit tests or if we want to expand it to add tests. And also, we check for things like feature flags. One of the things that we like to do to, in order to allow us to move quickly is we like to add feature flags to our application. What that allows us to do is we can put in code that's actually turned off, make sure that when we deploy the code, it doesn't break anything, and then actually be able to turn it on to a subset of users so that we can actually test it live against production. So why did we choose to use Selenium? Well, the reason that I decided to go the Selenium route was one that it's very well supported with a large community. Selenium, is, as far as I'm aware, is, is eventually going to be the W3C standard uh, for web automation. So it just makes sense to use it. It also supports a large number of languages. It's got numerous bindings for Ruby, Java, Python, etc. cetera. Uh, supports pretty much all the major browsers. Safari, Firefox, Chrome, IE, I believe it even has uh, support for Edge now. Works across uh, operating systems, Mac, Windows, Linux works on. Uh, and obviously, Sauce Labs, because one of the things that we didn't want to have to do was to have to build out our own in-house uh, Selenium grid to be able to support all of these different uh, browser OS combinations. Um, in terms of the automation framework, the decision I made was to go with the Ruby, RSpec, and page objects. So I, I just happen to like the Ruby binding specifically because it allows me to use RSpec. And for anybody who hasn't used RSpec, it's a really, really nice uh, TDD, test-driven framework, basically, for uh, Ruby that allows you to write really, really nice English and self-documenting tests. And a little later on in the presentation, I'll give you an example of how that looks and why that's so nice. Also, we use the page object methodology. And what makes that nice is that we abstract out all of the Selenium details and all the how am I getting this, where is that element found from the actual tests itself so that uh, someone who doesn't really know what's going on doesn't have to know. They can just look at the test and they'll understand what its purpose is. In terms of the servers that we decided to use, we went with Jenkins. Jenkins is pretty well used by many places to do CI and CD, and it's fairly easy to set up, so we just decided to go that route. Uh, it manages all of our builds and tests. 
it allows for parallelism, which speeds up our test greatly, and I'll give an example of that in a little bit. And also, as I said, it's another piece of technology that just works very easily with Sauce Labs. But when you go do, when you try to do uh, continuous deployment, it's definitely not easy. It takes, as I said, you have to really have buy-in from most of the organization to want to do this, and so I'm going to explain some of the, the pitfalls or the challenges, basically, that, that we face. So the first thing we had to do is, well, how are we actually going to build this thing? And to start, we only had one dev who basically had the deploy keys, which obviously isn't very scalable, because as soon as we start to have three, four, five, six devs, we don't want to have to rely upon one dev to actually have to do every single deploy. You know, every dev should be able to push out his code and be responsible for his deploy. So our initial solution was we just had a simple self script that any of the devs could run. They would have to, uh, but but as I say, it was kind of a pain because in order to do that, you had to SSH to a specific box. You had to become a specific user. You had to run the script. You had to make sure the build works. The output wasn't always very clear as to what broke or why it broke. And you know some of the devs then would not be able to figure out what, what happened with their thing. They'd have to go and find the developer who actually wrote the script. So it was kind of a tedious process. So as we went along, we, we started to improve on that. And then we decided to use a tool called Hubot. I put the link in here. And, and uh, for anybody who doesn't know what Hubot is, it's basically uh, a robot assistant that you can use in chat, like HipChat or Slack, to allow you to do integrations with things like your Jira, your Jenkins, uh, any of those kinds of things to allow you to do things and like that. And what we use it for is to actually do our builds through AWS. Um, another challenge is when you're actually doing CD, what is the dev testing responsibility? And, and one of the things that I had mentioned is that QA is obviously we're quality assurance, but quality of the product is everybody's responsibility in a continuous deployment environment. So what's the dev's responsibility? Well, the devs write the code, so they should be testing it. But for them, the key part is the actual unit testing itself them testing their pieces in isolation helps to ensure that they're making sure that the low level pieces are working properly. And that's why I said, you know, the PRs that we do are really meticulously looked at in terms of testability and unit testing. Um, anytime they want to deal with third party dependencies, they mock stuff because again, when we're testing at the unit level, we don't want to have to have requirements that you have to go out and hit a third party to check this stuff. Um, Front ends, obviously, they need to do checks for their code across browser, and that's another area where Source Labs comes into play, as I say below, because Source Labs not only allows you to run automated tests, but you can also manually select different browser OS combinations and check there. That's really nice because now you can actually look at your whatever changes you're making in any browser combination you want. It would be very, very difficult for me to tell my ops team or have the time or the money to basically say, okay guys, I need you to go build me this huge Selenium grid that's always up, that's always maintained and allows us to do all the testing we want. We're a small shop. We don't really have the resources to do that. Um, another thing that we implemented as we went along, we realized that, uh, you know, we had our staging environment, we had our production environment, and then devs had local, but local was difficult for other people to look at. Uh, so if a dev had something on their local environment and we wanted to look at something locally on their box, it was difficult because they're basically just running it on their machine. So what we decided to do was create what we call sandbox environments. Sandbox environments are basically mirror image environments of staging, but they allow us to deploy local versions of the code and branches to any of those environments. This basically gives devs the ability to access real DBs, but against their code and then allows QA to look at new features, to build new tests against those things in isolation before they're ever actually merged into the uh, code base. So as I said, you know, another challenge when we're doing uh, continuous deployment is what do we actually want to test? You know, do we want to test everything? Uh, 
Probably not. I mean, that's a nice, I, it's a nice goal to have that you want to test every single thing. And, you know, it would be nice if we could, but how practical is that? I mean, do we test every single, do we have to have 100% unit test coverage? Probably not. So what we decided to do is from the uh, standpoint of we have unit tests, we want to achieve a certain unit test threshold. But from the standpoint of regression testing, we, we wanted to create what's called a critical path. And basically what the critical path is, is the set of tests that we want to run on every deploy to make sure that these things can never break. So, for example, we may say, well, if the user is having an issue searching for a specific location, uh, we may be able, we may be okay with that if that happens and we'll fix it quickly. But if the user does a search, adds something to cart and then can't pay, that's simply unacceptable. That can never happen. Mm -hmm. So we make a determination and we say these 10 or 15 different Selenium jobs have to run every deploy. Then we have a superset of 20, 30, 40 other jobs that test other different scenarios and other parts of the system. Those will run every half an hour, let's say, and they will detect something that may be broken and will find it quickly and repair it quickly, which is what CD allows us to do. So a lot of people ask, well, who's responsible for writing these Selenium tests and, and why do you make that decision? Um, in our play, in, 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 Go, in GoZengo, the decision was made to, to let QA basically own the Selenium tests. And, and this was a decision that I pushed for. And the reason why is that it allows for central ownership of the code. One of the things I mentioned is that our Selenium repo is its own repo in our GitHub, um, in our GitHub group, whereas we also have our application repo. Um, this allows us so this allows devs basically to concentrate more on the writing of the code and the unit tests. Also, QA tends to have a more, uh, a larger breadth of knowledge of the application as a whole, whereas devs usually are working on specific parts of the application. So it's usually a good thing that the QA guys are writing because they know, well, if I do this, this is probably going to get affected, and if this happens, this is going to get affected. Now, that's not to say that the devs will never have to work with these tests. There may be times where they're doing refactors and they may need to update stuff. QA is always there to help, and we're also willing to do a lot of the refactor. But one of the ways in which we write the tests is we write them in a way that's very DSL-like, which is basically making it such that it doesn't really matter what language you know, it doesn't really matter how much of Selenium you know, this is so, this is designed in a way that makes it very easy for any dev to pick up very quickly. And if they have to make updates, they can. And I'll show some examples of this in a minute. So how does the workflow go? So right now what we do is we have a dev who will make a pull request. The PR has to be approved. And in order for the PR to be approved, unit tests have to be added. All existing unit tests have to pass. And if there is a feature flag, uh, created uh, because of necessity, we want to we want to create this new feature, but we don't want to turn it on yet. We check for that as well. We then, if all that's approved, we then deploy to staging using Hubot, and the critical path tests will run via Jenkins and Sauce Labs. Um, when deploying to staging, the way we do it is we have a queuing system. So obviously, we can't have 20 people deploying to staging at one time. So it's kind of a first in, first out uh, queue. Basically, devs get in line. Uh, to try to keep the queue moving as quickly as possible, uh, the CP jobs that we have, critical path, we try to keep them under five or six minutes so that we're not clogging the queue up because we want to be as quick as possible. Um, another thing that allows devs to go quicker is we do allow devs, if two or three devs basically have PRs that are ready to go and they agree, they can... Uh, go together with those PR requests if they choose, but one dev has to take ownership of that, and uh, the other devs need to be available if anything goes wrong. So let me give you a quick demo of uh, the uh, of how we do this through Jenkins. So I'm going to bring up our uh, Jenkins. Uh, here, and I'm going to go to what we have as our critical path tests. 
So you have a job called critical path. And this critical path, as you can see, has a whole bunch of sub, of sub jobs. These sub jobs basically are all the things that we've determined have to be passing every time we do a deploy. If you kick off this job, this will send a message to our HipChat client, and it will then go out to Sauce Labs, and all of these jobs will run in parallel. So if we come here, we can see we have a couple of jobs actually running right now, but we would see all 10 of these jobs starting to run, and within about, as you can see here, usual duration is about five to six minutes. Within about five or six minutes, we would know if this deploy was good. If the deploy is good, thumbs up, and then you can start and do whatever other things you need to do. Um, so how do we actually get this to happen? Um, if we look at the code here, so I'll show you a little bit of code. We have a, a Sauce Labs function that basically its purpose is to instantiate the driver. It determines what you know, uh, whether we're doing cloud testing or local testing, it determines if uh, what um, OS we want to use, which uh, browser we want to use, and then depending upon all that, it will set up all the capabilities we want, and then just simply go out to Sauce Labs and instantiate it. So each of these jobs is doing that, and that's what allows all of these jobs to get off to Sauce Labs. And this is really only about 100 lines of code. It's nothing major. Uh, What's also nice, and one of the things that uh, Sauce Labs allows me to do, is if we would go, if we go and look at one of these jobs, so let's say one of the jobs fails, we're able to add in to the console output basically a link directly to the Sauce Labs job. Now, Sauce Labs allows you to authenticate uh, these, this link so that if I'm a developer and I had a job that failed, I can just go here, click it, and it will immediately take me to the failed job, and I can then go and look at, well, why did it fail? Uh, oh, I, it's not obvious yet. Let me go, maybe I'll take a look at the screencast, and I'll see why this failed if I look at the playback. But, that, but what all of this is doing is it's making things as fast as possible in terms of feedback for the developers, so developers can find bugs as quickly as possible and fix them as quickly as possible with a, without a lot of hurdles in their way. Now, as I said, I, was, I wanted to show you an example of one of the tests. So this is an example of the output of one of our RSpec tests. So as you can see at the very top here, we specify which environment we want. We specify what browser we want, which are basically switches that I've built in to my framework. And then we run a specific test. By using the format documentation option, we get this really nice and easy to read output. So as you can see here, it's basically, if you didn't know anything about Selenium, if you didn't know anything about RSpec, you would be able to read this and understand exactly what this test did. If there was any failure, you would see a failure on that line next to it and know exactly what failed. So if I have should take the user to the 404 page and there's a failure next to it, I know I couldn't get to the 404 page for some reason. Very straightforward. So how do we get it to prod? Well, CP passed. We know that it's good, and all the existing and that you know basically ensures that all the existing functionality that we deem to be critical is good. And we know that uh, any features that are behind a feature flag are turned off. We then ask Hubot to deploy to production. Once the deploy goes to production, we have monitoring on production to basically monitor how production goes, and the dev is responsible for ensuring that. After a deploy for the first five or so minutes, they check, uh, they basically keep an eye on production to make sure nothing goes completely. So that's, that's pretty much what we are at and how we have things right now. Um, some of the things that we want to do down the line is we definitely want to do uh, mobile web testing. We, we're talking about uh, the ability of our web application to be able to, to uh, have uh, breakpoints so that depending on what, uh, what browser you're on, whether it's iOS, uh, Firefox, 
uh, iOS, Android, if you're on an iPad, an iPhone, if you're on a regular desktop, that these different breakpoints will show the website in a different way. Uh, one of the things that we have that I've started to put into place is the ability to actually do uh, tests using Appium, which is basically another wrapper around the Selenium web driver, but it allows you to drive tests using uh, using uh, uh, Appium as opposed to Selenium and allows them to drive them in either uh, 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 phone simulators or on actual devices. So as you can see here, I have this new function here called drive driver Appium sauce. And what it allows us to do is we can now say, well, I want to actually run this test in an iOS browser on an iPhone, which is what this test and capabilities will allow us to do. What's really nice about that is since this is mobile browser, I can literally use the exact same tests, basically, that I was using before to test the same thing. So if I want to test a search for a package, I can basically use the same exact functions, the same exact page objects. The only difference is, is I'm now instantiating uh, a driver for the iOS uh, device as opposed to a regular desktop web browser. Um, another thing that we want to get to in the future is testing on native applications. Again, that would be something we'd use for, uh, we'd use Appium for. Now that's a little more difficult because native applications are, are a bit of a different beast. We don't actually have a native app right now that's down the road for us, but when we do that, the idea would be that we'd have a separate test repository that would work specifically with Appium, and we would break that code out to be both for iOS and for Android. Another really, really cool piece that we've been working on is visual diff testing. Uh, for those who don't know, visual diff testing is basically the idea of we don't care so much about the function of the page. What we care is the visual look and feel of the page in different browsers. And has something changed dramatically that it looks broken so that this button is now misaligned? We use um, a third party called Appley Tools to do this, but what's really nice is that we can use Sauce in conjunction with Appley Tools to actually get this for us. And I'll give you an example right here. We don't actually have this fully baked in yet. This is more of a proof of concept. So we have a third type of driver instantiation called Visual Diff Driver. And what Visual Diff Driver does is it instantiates the Appley Tools uh, application, or the API, and then also instantiates a Sauce Labs driver. By doing this, we can run uh, this type of job against uh, Sauce Labs uh, with whatever browser and uh, OS combination we want, and then we can actually go and look at the difference in Appley Tools. So I'll give you an example. Uh, so if we look down here at the very bottom, we have what's called the Visual, uh, Visual Diff B2C Hotel Landing Page. If we look here, we'll see that this one passed, no problems. However, we have another job. This is the landing page, and we can see, oh, something just broke. I want to go take a look at this. So again, I've uh, modified it so that it allows us to actually go and see the diff right in Applitudes, but this is having been run through Sauce Labs. I can now go here, and I can bring up a visual comparison and see highlighted where the differences are. And I can say, oh, yeah, well, we expected that. That's something we wanted to be done, so we'll accept it and save it. If we didn't want it, we would have to tell the devs, hey, something's wrong here. You need to go fix this. So these are some of the new and uh, more robust tools that we'll be adding to the continuous uh, deployment stuff. But this gives you an idea of all the different things that we, we want to do to continue to build upon our continuous deployment system. Um, another thing we want to do is we want to improve our queuing system. Right now, the queuing system is kind of the honor system. Hey, I was here first, uh, so uh, I'm going, don't deploy while I'm deploying and so on. We want to get to a point where we can use things like QBot to actually say, 
person, developer X, is in the queue, uh, you cannot deploy until developer X is done. And that's something that we'll be working for. Um, finally, one of the things I, I, I just want to stress is, you know, we're always refining the, pro the, the this process, as I said, but this process and this uh, this idea of using continuous support, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, for, for larger companies, going agile and, and being iterative and so on may not be an option. I mean, you may be doing something where you're building uh, machines that have to deal with, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, they shoot um, radiation into cancer patients. Let's give an example of that. And, and we don't want to kind of fly by the seat of our pants with that. We need to know that that's always going to work 100% every time. In other cases like us, you know, we're willing to go fast as long as we can catch things fast. We're willing to, we're willing to accept a higher level of risk. And, and CD allows us to do that. Uh, and again, we are not just saying, well, we don't care about quality. We really care about quality, but that's why we have to be very meticulous about all the things that we cover, uh, what all the devs test, what QA tests, and basically ensuring that everybody takes quality seriously. And um, that's it. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Awesome, Daniel, that was really great. Thank you so much. Um, we did get some good questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and dive into those. And if you have a question, go ahead and submit it in the Q&A, and I'll try and get to all of them. Uh, the first question is just a clarification. Um, someone's just wondering if all of your Selenium scripts are written in Ruby. Uh, they're written in Ruby, and they're using – so basically we use Ruby, and then our spec is the testing framework within Ruby that I use. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, this question came in as two, so I'm going to read both of them because they kind of relate. Okay. Uh, do you have problems with flaky tests? How do you deal with those tests, um, and do you have any criteria you know, how do I understand the ROI of fixing them, deleting them, et cetera? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Flaky tests can really destroy uh, the devs, uh, the devs uh, feeling about CD because the idea is, you know, well, if I run the test and it breaks, I know it broke. So flaky tests are always an issue that we always have to deal with. Um, the way we try to go about that is any new test that we build, we try to run it at least 10 or 15 times in a row to make sure that it doesn't break, to see if we can catch any kind of flakiness before we even put it into rotation. Uh, a lot of the flakiness that we have found can be uh, things like, well, we're dealing with third parties. So, for example, if our third party, uh, if we need to do a payment and against our staging environment and the third party's uh, testing environment is flaky, that can hamper us. But there are reasons why we may want that third party integration as opposed to mocking it, because if we mock it, then if something changes on their end, we may not know about it. Flaky tests, basically, anytime they arise, what we do is we try to see what the issue was, quarantine it, and if there is a fix we can make, we do. If we can't fix the problem, then we either remove that flaky test or we try to figure out a different way to build the test. Okay, thank you very much. Um, along with that, they wrote in, uh, well, when you find that kind of problem, do you immediately stop what you're doing or delay um, the resolution or sometimes delay a bit of the resolution. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Uh, well, we wouldn't just necessarily stop what we were doing. The only place uh, where we might do that is if we find a test that's kind of flaky in the critical path. But again, we wouldn't even put tests into critical path until we had vetted them properly. If we find that someone made a change that's causing them to be flaky and they are in our critical path, that is something that we would stop and say, okay, we have to take a look at this and figure out why. Okay, perfect. Gotcha. Um, next question, do you test all your critical paths on all browsers and devices every time you release? Uh, we would love to do that. Uh, unfortunately, one of the issues is, is that uh, even with Sauce Labs, you know, we're limited in the number of v VMs that we have uh, at any one time. What we try to do is we try to have all of the different tests check at least one version of one browser and so on and so forth so that 
our application as a whole is getting enough cross-browser, cross-OS checks that we feel comfortable enough that that's sufficient. Ideally, we'd like to run every test in every browser and all that, but, at, at, at the, but with the amount of time that would probably take and the amount of resources that would take up, we just don't see that as being feasible right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Um, what would you say is the minimum size team to be able to do CV slash CI? We have just one dev right now, no QA and no sysadmin. Is automated testing too much overhead for us right now? I would say in that one case, uh, if the dev is doing it, uh, as long as he's writing unit tests, that's probably sufficient. But as soon as you start to add two or three or four devs, you're going to want to have that automated stuff because as soon as you now introduce that sense of, well, I have access to it and he has access to it and she has access to it and they're working on different things, they're going to break something and not having those tests built out will become problematic. So I would say as soon as you start thinking that you're going to be bringing new people in, you would probably want to have someone that we start to build at least a basic set. I mean, it does, you don't have to go nuts and build hundreds of tests. It can basically be two or three things that just check basic functionality. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, next question, how do you decide what to cover in UI automation and what to do in unit tests? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Well, from obviously from the standpoint of QA, you know, we're checking a lot of things from a regression point of view. So we're looking at flows. So we want to check pretty much as much of the UI as we can. From the unit testing standpoint, you know, the idea is that we, you know, QA will talk to the devs and basically say, look, you know, we'll cover stuff for you on the front end and we may even ask you for some API hooks to allow us to get to certain points in the application much faster so we can test things for you. But you gotta, you have to be responsible for things like, well, does the math make sense? Does, uh, if I call X, am I going to get this back? Because we, from the standpoint of testing the UI, need to be confident that the back end is, is tested enough so that we can be assured that the numbers that we see on the front end are accurate. Because we really don't have a way to know that unless it's been unit tested properly. Right, okay, perfect. Um, next question, uh, how many times per week or per day do you deploy to production? Uh, currently we deploy, I would say, anywhere between 20 to 25 times a day. Uh, we have the capability to deploy literally as many times as we want during the day. I mean, we're limited by the number of hours in the day, obviously, but basically, Basically, I would say we average anywhere between 15 to 25 in a day. Wow, okay, great. Um, how long did it take for you to evolve from ground zero to your current level of the CD process? Uh, from the day I started until now. Like, it's, it, like I said, it's, it's an ever-evolving process. It is growing pains and everything you add is going to cause issues and things you have to correct. So like even now, as I said, we're not even finished with what CD is going to be to us. What our CD is right now is going to change probably in three months. It'll still work on these same basic uh, foundations, but how each part will work, I can't even tell you what it'll be in three months. Gotcha. Uh, great. So let's See, um, are, are critical path decisions a collaborative effort with dev and QA? Um, not so much dev and QA. I mean, dev does have input in it. If they feel there's something that they want, QA is more than happy to build that for them. But I think it also goes to what the product managers want, because the product managers are the ones who can more accurately define, like, this is critical. This cannot break. I, I mean, I think QA can also help to drive those decisions, because we can say, well, this can't break. If this breaks, you know, everything falls apart. But it's, it's, it's kind of in conjunction with the, the, the product owners, QA, and dev kind of making those choices. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure if you covered this. Um, a few kind of questions just around Appium and mobile, um, and they were asking how you would run your CI for Appium. 
Um, well, it depends. So as I said, there's, there's two different things you can do with Appium. Uh, what we currently have implemented is Appium, but that's only driving simulators using their actual web browsers. We're not talking about native applications. So in that case, you can pretty much do it as we're doing now. You just execute the tests like any other test. It will launch a browser, and it will basically tell you whether or not it failed. So you can put those jobs into critical path if you want it. If you're talking about native applications, that's, that's a little trickier because, for example, like if you want to build iOS, you know, it's, it, you can build it, but even after you've built it, you can't release it to the wild. You have to first submit it to the iOS store. They have to review it. They have to uh, give you a time when they're going to release it if they do. So there's inherent problems with the CD model there. Yeah. However, what I would say is when I worked at a prior job where we did have an iOS application, what we tried to do is we put the majority of the business logic on the back end so that even if we submitted the, the, um, the, app, the app to the store, if we knew that all of the back end things were working and we could turn switches on and off to add features, that allowed us to do continuous deployment because we can always make changes to the back end and then roll them back if we need to because we had tests continually monitoring the system. So my, my, my way of thinking is if you want to do something like that, the best way to do it is to put most of the logic on the back end because you can continually update that without having to submit to the store. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, while we're on Appium, um, someone was just curious, you know, why, why a mobile tester would choose Appium versus the Apple functional automation framework. Um, one, for the simple reason that Appium allows you to write in pretty much any language you want. You can write in Ruby, you can write in Java. Like I said, I'm actually able to use my existing page objects that I've already written in Ruby that I use in my Selenium scripts to do the exact same thing in the mobile app. So I don't have to write new tests. If you're going to use, if you've already written Selenium stuff and now you want to go use, you know, Apple's tool, that's fine. But now you're going to have to write a whole new set of tests that basically are repeating a lot of the stuff that you're already doing in the browser. Okay, gotcha. Um, how many tests do you have and how many do you run um, in parallel? Um, well, we have, I don't know, I would say we have a thousand tests, maybe, something like that. Uh, if you, we have about 10 or 11 suites that run in the critical path, and I think within those, we probably have a good two to 300. So let's say 300 run every time we execute a deploy. Okay, gotcha. Um, is the server configuration management involved in your CI CD pipeline? For example, Chef, Puppet, or Salt? Um, there, we do, we do use, um, I think it's Chef, but I'm not really familiar with that part of the process. That's more left off to the DevOps guys and the ops team, so I can't really speak to that. But yes, there is, there is a Chef component to how we bring that stuff up. Okay, gotcha. And and speaking of kind of the the team, um, what there people are curious what your dev to QA member ratio is, and are the QA people um, software engineers or kind of what's their their experience? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think there there's a there's a a thing in the industry like people want to say, well, we want. Uh, QA engineers, and, and it's hard to really define what a QA engineer is. So I, I'm, I would say I'm a QA engineer, but I'm not a developer. I am someone, I can code, I can build automated frameworks, I can, you know, get my hands dirty and figure out, you know, why something isn't working, look in the logs, and so on and so forth. But I'm not going to build you an application. That's not where my area of expertise lies. And I think uh, one of the things that's important is uh, you know, devs a lot of times go and they become, you know, they, they'll bring in a dev to be a uh, the engineer in test, but there's a, there's a different mindset between what QA does and what dev does. So I think it's important that whoever you have to bring in to do that has the mindset of what is QA as opposed to I need to test stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. 
Um, I think I'm going to uh, ask you one last question, and we'll go ahead sure. and wrap things up. Um, should there be any manual testing or should everything be automated? No, you absolutely positively should do manual testing. Automation is the idea that, you know, anything new that I've built should not break the stuff that I already have because I can't, I, I don't want to spend hours upon hours every time we build something to have to check that we didn't break something. And we're always adding to that as we add new features. But when you're doing new features, that stuff should always be tested manually because uh, there are things, for example, uh, you may get requirements and then you may realize, well, these requirements are missing things. Did they think of this? Did they think of that? Uh, you don't have tests for it yet. You'd have to build them. And even if you start building them, you're going to find things like that. So there's always a, a manual component to it. And there are always things that you tend to want to try when you're doing manual testing that you wouldn't do in an automated uh, setting, for example, like maybe I want to check uh, 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 JS injection, or maybe I want to do something silly like you know triple click a button to make sure that the button the first time I click it is inactivated. And these things you're not going to really do on uh, an automated test, but you would want to do them when manually checking something. Right, right, that makes sense. All right, well, thanks for um, answering all of those questions. We had a lot of interested um, people. And uh, thank you so much for the presentation today. Um, again, anyone who's on the line, um, we are going to send out the recording and the slides tomorrow via email. Um, so take a look out for that. And if you have any questions or um, anything we didn't get to, you can always email uh, me and I can get in touch with Daniel at webinar at saucelabs.com. And with that, um, have a great afternoon. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, everybody.